what's going on everyone? Uh, back with another voiceover for this push workout. So let's just jump right into it. The first exercise that I did on this day was an incline dumbbell press. And this was actually the only chest movement that I did. The basic idea is that I don't need to do a ton of chest volume because it's not an area that I'm trying to specialize in developing right now. I do think that bodybuilding is really all about specialization and you should dedicate most of your recovery capacity to exercises that train muscles that you want to develop relative to other muscles. Um, so basically weak point prioritization. Chest is definitely not a weak point for me and so I allocate the majority of my volume on push days to shoulder work. In any case, uh, I do like to kick it off with an incline press. I think that pretty much everyone can always do with a little bit more upper chest. Just to make sure everyone's on the same page, the pec major muscle has two heads, so a clavicular head and a sternal head. The clavicular head is that part of the chest that has the fibers descending and it attaches at the clavicle, hence the name. And I wanna focus on two resources here. Uh, so the first is, to my knowledge, a German book that I definitely didn't get my hands on, but I was pointed towards it by Supversity and is uh, where I've actually pulled a number of the studies for these videos from. A book by Bohek, Behrens, and Buskies, published in 2000 is referenced, in which it was found that, surprisingly, the decline press was best at activating the upper pec fibers. However, it wasn't controlled for load. When you normalize the findings to control for load, you find that a 45 degree incline had a 69% increase in upper pec activation, relative to pec activation overall. And so it can probably be fairly confidently concluded that some sort of incline is probably better for stimulating the upper pecs, which makes sense based on what we know about biomechanics and how the fibers run. And then the other paper in support of this is Trebzital 2010. And as you can see from the graph, there's not a whole lot of difference between zero and 56 degrees, uh, but there does seem to be something of a sweet spot around 44 degrees. In case anyone was wondering, uh, load was matched in this paper. But even with that said, guys, there's not a whole lot of difference here. We're talking about pretty small differences in EMG activity. So ultimately, I think you should find an angle that you can feel best. You can establish a mind-muscle connection with your upper pecs on and then roll with that. After the incline dumbbell press, I moved on to a machine shoulder press. And the main reason why I'm using the machine here is in part because I'm not able to do overhead pressing right now because my lower back is still giving me some trouble. Uh, so the machine is just a little bit more comfortable for me. But also I do really like using machines here, especially if I'm using free weights for my main chest movement because I can take the sets closer to failure. I'm planning on doing a podcast on this topic in the coming month or two, but I'll just keep it brief here and say that I, I do think, or at least I'm under the opinion that the research does indicate an advantage to training uh, to failure. And just as two quick examples of this, you have Geising 2016, in which trained subjects were found to have an increased hypertrophic response as a result of training to failure versus not training to failure using a high load. And then Berditale 2012 also found support for increased muscle protein synthesis in the post-workout period when the subjects were training to failure. Um, so I think that it does have some merit, and if you are going to be training to failure, you should probably do it on more machine-based exercises or isolation movements. After that, I did a Smith Machine one-arm press. Uh, this was kind of just a fun movement for me. I actually found this one from Dexter Jackson. This is just a way for me to get in a little bit of extra vertical pressing in a different plane. So with the arm in front of you rather than to the side, so training a little bit more shoulder flexion and hitting the front delt quite a bit. After that, I moved on to cable laterals. Uh, so I've explained in other videos why I do these leaning away, uh, but the long story short of it is that you get more side delt activation and less rotator cuff involvement when you lean away because the supraspinatus contributes quite significantly to the first 30 degrees of shoulder abduction. Uh, so by leaning away, you get more side delt involvement. And I'll do a few of these to the front and a few of them behind. Uh, I'd recommend playing with those seeing if you feel one in your side delts more than the other and just go with that. After that, I moved on to machine lateral raises and I know that some people are probably thinking that this is an absurd amount of volume. However, uh, I think that that is a very blanket statement to make and volume and frequency recommendations I think are very specific to the individual. In my case, as someone who's been training for 11 years now, uh, I do require quite a lot of volume uh, 
to make progress. So um, I do try to sort of cram it in. In any case, I like the machine laterals because with these, I do a double drop set. So I'll reduce the weight by 50% after reaching failure the first time, go to failure again. Then I'll reduce the weight 50% again, go to failure again. Uh, the reason I like to do these on the machine is because the seat and the chest brace ensures that I'm not getting too sloppy and uh, allows me to focus more on actually using my side delt. And in terms of drop sets, uh, there's not a lot of literature on this. However, it makes intuitive sense in that uh, you still get to go heavy and then you get to add a little bit of volume after. Uh, so I think that they can be effective from a programming perspective. And then they do have some empirical support in terms of increasing total workload as seen in Benti's 2012. So then I finished off all of the shoulder stuff uh, with a cable upright row. This of course does hit the traps to a degree, but primarily the side delts through shoulder abduction. And I do a little bit of a different spin on these, so I'll externally rotate slightly at the top. And for a workout like this, I will typically do um, banded external rotations randomly throughout the workout between exercises while I'm resting, that sort of thing. And then finally, I finished off this workout with reverse cable crossovers. And I do this just because I think it is a good idea to at least have a one-to-one -one ratio of pushing to pulling. When it comes to postural support, I think that having well-strengthened posterior your chain, including rear delts, is very important. I always try to include some kind of rear delt movement at the end of my push days. So I did three sets of 12 to 15 uh, on these. I think that a lot of people are under the impression that if they just do some face pulls or reverse flies, then it's gonna fix their posture. Um, I don't think that's the case unless you have a specific imbalance. However, it certainly isn't going to hurt to train them directly. And when it comes to fixing posture, I think you do have to do a little bit more than this. And that could be as much behavioral and having to undergo specific postural retraining as much as strengthening a muscle that uh, might not be. Uh, strong enough for you to keep yourself upright. So that's going to conclude this workout commentary, guys. I hope that you liked it. I plan on doing a more in-depth one in the future as this is just my current routine, not necessarily what I would recommend to everyone else. Uh, so for those of you who have been requesting a chest workout or a scientific chest workout, uh, I do plan to do that in the near future. So stay tuned for that. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of this vlog.